1980's Halloween knockoff, Friday the 13th, would become a surprise mega-success for director and producer Sean S. Cunningham and Paramount Pictures, who were now ready to go all-in on the potential franchise. But there was just one problem. Their main villain, psychotic mom Pamela Voorhees, was very much dead. Not having anticipated the immediate demand for a sequel, and with most of the film's main characters also killed off, Cunningham and original Friday the 13th screenwriter Victor Miller were at a loss as to where to take the teen exterminating franchise next. Early on, the idea of continuing Friday the 13th as an anthology series gained some traction, with each film planned to be a different take on the superstitious calendar day. The producers imagining busloads of teens flocking to cinemas year after year, terrified to witness the next spine-tingling tale. Unfortunately, much like the Halloween series after it, this was not meant to be. The, it seems, fateful decision to tack on Pamela Voorhees' drowned son, Jason, bursting from the water for a hair-raising final scare, something that was meant as no more than a cheap shock in the context of a nightmare, would send the franchise down a path that no one, let alone its creators, could have predicted. Because general audiences would continue to flock to high body count entertainment in the early 1980s, Paramount executives demanded that they abandon the anthology concept and push forward with another Crystal Lake bloodbath instead, this time putting Jason Voorhees himself front and center as the bloodthirsty slasher, and unwittingly giving birth to a whole new kind of boogeyman. After Paramount Pictures made the push to head back to Crystal Lake, Sean Cunningham would not only choose to give up the director's chair, but initially washed his hands of the sequel altogether, finding the idea of Jason's miraculous survival too great a leap in logic to creatively overcome. This paired with losing the whodunit intrigue of the first film meant that there would be little left of the concept that he and writer Victor Miller had developed less than one year earlier. Despite this, however, Cunningham eventually agreed to return to shepherd the project, although strictly in a producing role. With their director having abandoned his post, then 30-year-old Steve Miner would step up to helm the film, having been an advocate for the inclusion of Jason Voorhees from the start. Miner, who had been the line producer on the original film, had also worked with Sean Cunningham on some of his earlier directing efforts, the young filmmaker being one of the reasons Cunningham ultimately decided to rejoin the production. Friday the 13th Part 2 would mark Steve Miner's official directorial debut. Like Cunningham, Victor Miller would refuse to move forward with Jason as the main antagonist and declined any involvement with the sequel's making the 1980 film remaining the screenwriter's one and only contribution to the long-running series. Following his exit, the producers moved quickly to bring on new talent. Codenamed Jason, the fast-tracked sequel would be penned by Ron Kurz, who was the natural choice as he had completed uncredited work on Miller's original script. The sequel also marked the first time Kurz would be credited using his actual name, having gone under the pseudonym Mark Jackson on his previous two films. In a way, the film serves as a kind of remake of its predecessor, and true, you could make that argument for several of the Friday the 13th sequels, but this of course was by design, the producers urging Kurz to emulate that film's winning formula in every possible way. Set five years after the events of Friday the 13th 1980, even though it was made just one year later, so technically it's the not too distant future of 1984. The story follows a group of Randy Young counselors in training who wander a little too close to Camp Blood, despite the warnings from local law enforcement and Crazy Ralph. And to no one's surprise, are picked off one by one by a depraved forest shack dweller named Jason. Interestingly, the exact date of the film, other than being set five years later, is never given, and therefore it can't be said with certainty that the sequel takes place on Friday the 13th. <laughs> Principal photography would begin in October 1980, almost exactly one year after the completion of Part 1. 
like the first production, filming would last less than a month. And unlike the original shoot, which was filmed in New Jersey, Friday the 13th Part 2 would be captured entirely in Connecticut, primarily in the small town of Kent and the New England village of New Preston. The production would also not return to New Jersey's Camp Nobibosco, the original Camp Crystal Lake, and would instead be filmed at the Kenmont and Kenwood campgrounds in Kent, doubling as Paul's school for camp counselors. Reportedly, the then owner of the camp, a man named Lloyd Albin, was extremely nervous about the production's presence, which he only agreed to because it was the off-season and Paramount was paying him to lodge the entire cast and crew. Albin was not only concerned that the production would destroy his property, but that his grounds being associated with a slasher movie would frighten away future campers. And as a result, he stipulated that there could be no panoramic shots of the property used in the film. Jason's shack was also constructed on Kentmont grounds and was left standing by the production after filming wrapped. However, Albin quickly had it torn down out of fear that it would become a pilgrimage site for trespassing fans. Nearly all of the crew members from the first production would be brought back for the sequel, most being Sean Cunningham regulars, and some even seeing significant promotions. Director of photography Peter Stein would replace original cinematographer Barry Abrams, having been a second unit camera operator on the original film. And following in Abrams' footsteps, Stein and director Steve Miner employed long slow burn takes and point of view shots of the killer in order to maximize tension and hold the suspense for as long as possible. In my opinion, Stein and Miner also offer more memorable imagery and shot compositions than what we get in the first film, and as a result, the sequel feels much more at home in the 1980s than its originator. Stein and Miner's framing is also complemented by some fun editing from Susan E. Cunningham, the then-wife of Sean Cunningham, who moved up from associate editor on the first production to the primary editor on the sequel. Also, this may be one of the greatest cuts of all time. Weirdly enough, the dog's mutilated corpse is later found by Jeff and Sandra, but then just magically shows up, alive and well, at the end. Many fans point to this contradiction as proof that the ending is just a dream, which makes about as much sense as Jason being alive, so whatever. Series composer Harry Manfredini would of course return to score the film, providing an expectedly similar sound as its predecessor. The composer's work on the first three films of the franchise would be released the following year in the form of an LP compilation album from Gramavision Records. The sequel would see the return of just three stars from the original film. Betsy Palmer briefly appears to Jason as an imaginary Pamela Voorhees, the esteemed actor apparently shocked that she was even asked to return. However, as she was never ashamed to admit, Palmer didn't mind collecting a paycheck, and ended up filming all of her lines in less than half a day in front of a studio black screen. According to those close to the actor, Palmer never saw the final film. Walt Gorney would make his second and final appearance in the fan-favorite role of Doomsayer Crazy Ralph, although the character's name is never actually stated in this film. Funny enough, Ralph's body is found in a pantry, which is exactly where Alice discovers him hiding at the start of part one. We didn't find any boy. Then he's still there. Still there. Still there. Still there. <laughs> Given the pseudo cliffhanger the original film ends on, Adrian King seemed destined to return as sole survivor Alice Hardy but a series of unfortunate events would lead to her role being significantly reduced. Soon after its premiere, King fell victim to an obsessed fan who relentlessly stalked her in the year following filming, even going as far as to break into her home. While an unsubstantiated rumor had spread that King requested her role be made as small as possible in order to maintain a low profile, it has also been stated that her agent had requested too much money and therefore her part was all but written out. King herself later added that she was more than ready and willing to take part in the follow-up, but that she had never even been given a copy of the script, and that when she eventually was called to set, she learned that most of the shoot had already been completed, and that she was actually there to film her character's death scene. King would only end up filming for two days in total, and all of her over-the-phone dialogue would have to be improvised due to the scene being unscripted 
What's more, King was mildly injured while filming Alice's death when the prop ice pick, which according to King had allegedly not been tested, failed to retract as it was pressed into her head. The sequel boasts one of the longest pre-title sequences of any film at that time, running about 12 minutes in length before the opening credits. Transversing an extensive dream within a dream flashback sequence and then following around Alice for quite some time before Jason gets to the point. Also, I love how Jason takes the kettle off the burner afterwards. But outside of the returning players, again, much like the first film, Friday the 13th Part 2 would have a cast of then mostly unknown actors. Russell Todd would land his biggest role to date as pretty boy Scott Chaney, and has the honor of being the first victim to be killed by Jason's signature machete. Although Stuart Charno had auditioned for the roles of both Scott and Jeff, he would ultimately step in as our token comic relief character, Ted, replacing Mark Nelson's Ned from the first film. Ted also has the distinction of being the only prankster character to, in this case accidentally, survive a Jason killing spree. At just 19 years old, Lori Marie Taylor's casting as Vicki Perry would mark her first role in a feature film, and fans often consider her death scene to be one of the least deserved kills in the series. The memorable death of Jeff and Sandra, played by Bill Randolph and Marta Kober, was likely inspired by a similar scene in Mario Brava's 1971 Jalo classic, A Bay of Blood. Although Sean Cunningham has denied this, and co-producer Dennis Murphy has declared this kill to be the best death scene in the movie, although infamously it would later fall victim to heavy censorship, as I'll discuss later on. And speaking of Marta Kober, who also makes her first big screen appearance, unbeknownst to the producers, the actor was only 17 years old at the time of shooting, which included the filming of a nude scene, and after learning of her underage status, the footage containing these shots was swiftly destroyed. The head-splitting death of Deputy Winslow would also fall victim to censorship, actor Jack Mark's death throes being significantly cut back post-review. In both the final film and Ron Kerr's original screenplay, the character is credited only as the cop, and never referred to by name on screen, only being handed the name Winslow several years later in the film's novelization. Friday the 13th Part 2 would, by far, remain Marx's most famous role, and one he was greatly proud of, the actor sadly having passed away earlier this year. Mark Jarvis, played by the late actor and model Tom McBride, also has one of the franchise's all-time gruesome deaths, his wheelchair bouncing down the steps against the storm being as disturbing today as I'm sure it was then. Kirsten Baker won the part of doomed skinny dipper Terry McCarthy, and at just 20 years old, came with the most feature film experience of the new cast. Terry is also the only character in the film to be killed off-screen, unless you count Muffin. Up-and-coming TV actor John Fury would make his first turn as a leading man in charming entrepreneur Paul Holt, and is perfectly serviceable in the role, not that he's given much to work with. It is debated among fans whether or not Paul actually survives the film, with those advocating that he lived pointing to the eight-person body count announced over the news broadcast at the start of Part 3. Also, his body is noticeably absent in Jason's shack at the end of the film, it has been rumored that Fury quit the production mid-filming over some creative disagreement, but this has since been debunked by his co-stars. Cast via audition, 21-year-old actor Amy Steele would make her major feature debut as final girl Jenny Field although Steele would later admit that she didn't take the film all that seriously at the time. Nonetheless, Steele gives a very natural and genuine performance, and like Alice Hardy, Ginny proves to be an unlikely threat to our killer. However, in earlier drafts, the character was planned to also be slaughtered by Jason, but the producers eventually concluded that the movie not only needed a survivor, but that the audience also had to have somebody to root for. In fact, Steele was invited back by Paramount to appear in Part 3 as well, in addition to potential future sequels. But at the advice of her agent, the actor declined the opportunity, a decision she would later come to regret. The now-retired actor said that while she enjoyed her time on the film, she found the whole experience to be very intense and at moments a little frightening. 
Steele also having performed all of her own stunts. Fun fact, the name Ginny Field is a nod to the film's production designer, Virginia Field, who served in the same role on part one. Bonus fun fact, according to the production's shot list, despite rampant fan speculation, the urine scene coming out from under the bed while Ginny hides from Jason is indeed meant to be hers and not the rats. As iconic as Jason Voorhees has become in modern popular culture, a rotten hockey mask embedded into the flesh of a machete-wielding zombie lug, his debut as the main antagonist in the series offers a much humbler beginning. Here, Jason looks like a skinny kid in a burlap flower sack and is very much a prototype of the character, physically more or less evenly matched with his victims. Friday the 13th makeup effects artist Tom Savini was asked to return for the second film, but officially declined due to scheduling conflicts. However, Savini is also on record stating that, like Cunningham and Miller, he wasn't interested in making a sequel that featured Jason as the antagonist. The producers next turned to future effects legend Stan Winston, who initially boarded the project but then bowed out shortly after the studio ultimately handing the job to then up-and-coming makeup effects artist Carl Fullerton. For the look of Jason, Fullerton would build upon Savini's design, adding a reddish beard and long hair that painted the character as something that feels more at home in the Wrong Turn or Hills Have Eyes franchises. And it supposedly took Fullerton just one day to design and mold Jason's facial prosthetics. The casting of Jason Voorhees, however, would be complicated. Steve Miner first sought to cast stunt actor and special effects assistant Tasso N. Stavrakis, who had doubled as Pamela Voorhees throughout the first film, but Stavrakis declined the offer, which he would later lament. Although most would go uncredited, all in all, Friday the 13th Part 2 would technically see five different performers take on the role of Jason Voorhees. And it should be noted that who played Jason at which points and for how long is hotly debated among both fans and former cast and crew members. So this is the best I could gather with what we've got. 20-year-old struggling actor Warrington Gillette would eventually be the first person cast as adult Jason, but would only end up playing the character in full in his unmasked form during the film's final jump scare, which was filmed early on. Gillette had originally auditioned to play good guy Paul Holt, but given his experience in minor stunt work, was asked to play Jason instead. Unfortunately, the actor would turn out to be ill-prepared for the level of stunts required for the role, something that became more and more apparent on his first day of filming. Primarily, Gillette had difficulty jumping through the glass, which had been pre-scored for breakage, and the stunt team resorted to great lengths in order to make the shot happen, although Gillette would, nevertheless, injure his head during one of the takes. The actor was also forced to endure the extensive makeup encompassing the whole of his head, which not only took seven hours to apply, but had to be worn for over 12 hours on the day of shooting, which included having one of his eyes totally obscured. Although Gillette's hands would be used in various scenes throughout the film, including the strangulation of Crazy Ralph, inevitably, Miner and the other producers came to the conclusion that the role desperately needed to be recast. I should add that Jason's explosion through the window was not the original ending planned. According to Peter Brack's series Chronology Crystal Lake Memories, the alternative conclusion would have seen Jason simply leaping out from behind a dresser. So yeah, you could see why they changed that. Also, as another bonus fun fact, you may or may not have noticed that the head of Mrs. Voorhees we zoom in on for the final shot is an actual actor in makeup under a prop table. This is because the ending originally showed Mrs. Voorhees' eyes popping open and the head smiling for one more scare, but Steve Miner and the producers felt the effect was a little too silly, and at the last minute chose to just freeze-frame the shot instead. Production assistant Jerry Wallace would briefly be tasked with stepping in as the killer, said to have been used in the deaths of Vicky, Jeff, and Sandra although makeup effects artist Carl Fullerton reportedly also took over for certain shots in that particular kill, given the level of effects involved. Following Gillette's unexpected departure, the late stunt actor Steve Dashowitz, or Dash, would embody Jason for the remainder of filming. Basically, anytime the character is seen wearing the burlap mask. 
and at 5 foot 11 and 175 pounds, Dash is the smallest actor to have played adult Jason to date. However, to Dash's dismay, he would only be credited as Jason's stunt double on the final film, Warrington Gillette receiving sole credit for the role. And similar to Gillette's experience, playing Jason would not come without its price. During the climactic scene, the actor would nearly lose one of his middle fingers when co-star Amy Steele accidentally struck his hand with a machete, leading to a trip to the ER and 13 stitches. In costume, mind you. On another night, Dash fell onto a pickaxe during the chase and broke his ribs, and another time even tripped and knocked himself out. The one-eyed burlap mask could likely be blamed for most of these faux pas, also leading to the development of a burning rash around the actor's brow. A mask, by the way, that was almost certainly stolen from the 1976 B-movie, The Town That Dreaded Sundown. Because the film's opening sequence was shot well after most of the actors had already completed filming, costume designer Ellen Lutter would have to double for Jason's legs as the character is seen walking across the street toward Alice's home at the start of the film. Therefore, while she may not have been the first person to have been cast as adult Jason, she was the first person to appear on screen as the character. There was a theme throughout production that the film needed to up the ante in terms of sex and violence as often as possible, and although the film's gore is relatively tame by modern standards, it would lead to the producers going head-to-head -head with the MPAA and the Classification and Rating Administration, or CARA who demanded that several cuts be made in order to avoid being branded with the dreaded X rating. As mentioned earlier, the censors particularly took issue with the double impalement of Jeff and Sandra, which was exasperated by its sexual context, and the board would target other bloodier shots as well. And as a result, 48 seconds in total would be removed from the final film, footage that wouldn't be seen for nearly 40 years. The day you count on for terror is not over. Friday the 13th, part two. The film debuted on May 1st, 1981 in New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, taking in $6.4 million in its opening weekend, and later expanding to 1,350 screens across North America. However, the sequel would not come without some direct competition. Opening the same weekend was the cult classic slasher Graduation Day, and one week later the summer camp slasher The Burning, essentially a Friday the 13th ripoff, would ignite theaters. And just one week after that, Happy Birthday to Me arrived to scare up cinemas. The film also bears some uncanny resemblances to 1981's Halloween 2, which, for a change, would be released several months after this film. Not only do both sequels open with extensive flashback sequences that recap the endings of their preceding films, but both also feature the killing of a law enforcement officer with a hammer to the skull, as well as close-up shots of a woman being jabbed in the side of the head. Not to mention a whole slew of shots and other broader coincidences that likely can be chalked up to the filmmakers on both productions adhering to the slasher movie textbook. While the sequel failed to outgross the original film by some margin, having raked in over $59 million in its initial 1980 run, it still managed to turn a worthy profit for the studio, taking in over $21 million worldwide on its $1.25 million budget. The sequel would hit video stores in late 1981 in the form of both VHS and Betamax cassettes from Paramount Home Video, and would later premiere on DVD in October 1999, and while this release restored its original widescreen aspect ratio, it offered almost nothing in the way of special features. However, in 2009, a deluxe edition would be released on both DVD and Blu-ray that, for the first time, offered archival and original behind-the-scenes featurettes and interviews. This release would later be included in two series box set collections in 2011 and 2013. In October 2020, cult media distributor Shout Factory, under their Scream Factory label, released the film as part of their limited edition 40th anniversary franchise box set, which not only featured a new 4K scan of the film's original camera negative, but also gave fans their first look at the previously unseen censored footage. Not long before, 
the New York-based film company Samuelson Studios discovered that makeup effects artist Carl Fullerton owned a decrepit VHS tape of an uncensored early print of the film. Commissioned specifically for this anniversary edition, the long-lost footage was carefully recovered and restored through a painstaking physical and digital process. And now, after decades of only existing in fans' imaginations, the grisly images are readily available online for the whole family to enjoy. As aforementioned, like the first film, Friday the 13th Part 2 would receive a belated novelization from author Simon Hawk, published by New Amer Library in September 1987. At just 167 pages in its original hardcover edition, the novel received criticism for essentially being an elaborate transcript of the film, although some fans have found value in Hawk's deeper dive into Jason's past and psychology, as well as his omniscient approach to the minds of his victims. I think that's well said, and uh, I can only add that, yeah, when the machete went into the head of the kid in the wheelchair, mm -hmm. that's about when I gave up on the picture. Uh, depressing is the, the key word in this discussion. Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times perhaps put it best. The movie is a cross between the mad slasher and dead teenager genres. About two dozen movies a year feature a mad killer going berserk, and they're all about as bad as this one. Some have a little more plot, some have a little less. It doesn't matter. Although often considered by fans to be a seminal entry in the franchise, due to its introduction of Jason as the killer, from a filmmaking standpoint, the sequel is often regarded as a fairly unremarkable slasher outing. To no one's surprise, it would be greeted by reviews that ranged from snarky and dismissive to flat-out scathing. One reviewer even deemed it dime store cheap, and another exploitative and gratuitous. Critics of the time highlighting its senseless violence, one-dimensional characters, and repetitive storytelling as its biggest failings. None of them, of course, were wrong, but it seems that they simply failed to understand how this could be its main appeal, and in many cases, flat out refused to. Paramount Pictures also offered no help in softening the blows. While executives were more than happy to collect the profits, the prestigious studio wasn't exactly proud of their hit slasher franchise, and certainly made no effort to flaunt it, even going as far as to deny critics and talk shows access to clips or footage for televised reviews, which, naturally, only bred further resentment. While no doubt an important entry in the franchise, it wouldn't be until the next film that Jason acquired his staple hockey mask and took on more familiar characteristics leaving Friday the 13th Part 2 as a bit of a black sheep of the earlier films in the series, having a greater departure in tone from the first film while also not quite being the series we would come to know and love. Therefore, it remains instead more of a relic of the early 80s slasher boom, one that stands out because of its connection to one of the most popular horror franchises of all time, but also a film no more complex or innovative than any of its contemporaries and its approach is as about as straightforward as they get. Bad man with weapon chases mischievous teens through the woods. And yet, like Jason himself, it has somehow survived. And while fans today are definitely divided over the not quite Friday the 13th, Friday the 13th sequel, audiences of the time were left clamoring for even more Jason. And because of its success, that's exactly what we got. So tell me your thoughts on Friday the 13th Part 2. Where does it rank for you in the 11 film franchise, or 12 if you want to count Freddy vs. Jason? And on a scale of this film to Jason X, how do you prefer your Jason Voorhees? Vulnerable and a little more squirrely, or big and intimidating as he would later become? I think I fall somewhere in the middle. Let's call it the final chapter. And as always everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and click like below and feel free to share. And don't forget to find me on Patreon at forward slash Leighton Eversol, where you'll gain early access to my channel's content and more. And of course, if you want to see more videos just like this one, go ahead and click subscribe.